Boy, that sounds like an after lunch kind of an applause if I ever heard one. Half of you are already asleep, I guess. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value. Um, I've been at Stansbury longer than anybody but Porter. And uh, I've got a presentation called Prepare for the Meltdown Now. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> so what am I talking about here? Well, I just popped this slide in earlier uh, this week because it, it was from the Financial Times and shows how financial crises have become more frequent um, as history has gone along. You see a nice little lull there in the mid-20th century, and then it's crisis, crisis, crisis. So I think we should talk about them <laughs> and how to handle them. You saw this yesterday, uh, a, for, a version of this, but this is, the, this is the full Monty. These are five, this is a graph of five valuation measures for the overall U.S. stock market. And it took me a while to figure this out. I used to try to keep track of the overall stock market in terms of its valuation, but it was a stupid, useless exercise. Most of the time, it just doesn't matter. When it does matter, I realized, is when it reaches extremes of valuation. Otherwise, it's just in the middle, you can't, it doesn't mean anything. Clearly, we are at an extreme of valuation. And these five measures that you see listed on the bottom, the, these are by Dr. John Hussman, an economist uh, whose work I follow, and this is really the primary piece of his work that I like. I think he's got this idea down pretty good. These measures are very good at kind of predicting what the next 10 years of returns in the U.S. stock market will be like. When they're very high like they are now, the next 10 years stink, you know, less than 1% a year right now. And on average, this is the result when the valuations get to where they are today. The best case average scenario historically is minus 45% on the S&P 500. That's, that's the good case. The worst case is about minus 60%. And that red line on the bottom, I put that there to show you the bottoms in 2009 and 2002, to show you how these events can wipe out years of gains. It's hard to tell, but the one in 2009 actually wiped out all the gains from 2000, or I'm sorry, from 1997. That's stocks. Here's bonds, corporate bonds. You see that? I added that little green line down the bottom. We're scraping the bottom of yields, so prices are very high. Treasury bonds, same thing. They didn't issue them in that space there where there's no data. Scraping the bottom of yields, high prices. And these are all negative yielding government bonds from countries like Switzerland. Every maturity in Switzerland from 10 years down is negative yield. That red line, that's 0% yield. Above that is a positive yield. Below it, you're guaranteed to lose money holding to maturity. So there's the German, what, that's the German two-year, the German five-year, the Japanese two-year. I mean, I could have put so many more of these up there, but you get the picture. These are supposed to be safe assets, and they're yielding negative, guaranteed to lose you money. This is an aggregate that Deutsche Bank created where they just kind of mushed bonds and stocks together and took it back to 1800. And back to 1800, more expensive than ever. It's from 15 developed market countries. Tear those two apart, and you see, well, maybe equities aren't exactly the most expensive they've ever been in history. Oh, good. Bonds are the most, they've ever, most expensive they've ever been in history. And bonds can crash, too. This is a Toys R Us bond. Yeah. It was trading at 97 when they announced bankruptcy. If you think markets are efficient, you need to study this graph. I mean, nobody knew, right? I mean, the thing actually was down below 90 and recovered to 97 and then crashed to 18, and now it's at 30. So what do people do when returns positively stink in stocks and bonds? They go to these alternatives like private equity. So what should you expect to happen? This always happens. When things get really speculative and crazy and returns are tiny or negative, prospective returns in the future are tiny or negative, private equity funding hits new highs. 240 billion this year into private equity. And the top is the money going into private equity. 
the blue and the yellow are the valuations being pushed up by all the money going into private equity in, in the U.S., in buyouts in the U.S. and Europe. So all that crap is overvalued too. In July, Apollo raised basically $25 billion for the largest private equity fund ever. And I was like, huh, wh when was the last largest private equity fund ever? And by the way, that's just about two months ago to the day. Just about. Well, the last time was August 9th, 2007. Two months after that was October 9th, 2007. The frickin' top, the top to the day. Look, I'm not saying that an all-time high, you know, biggest private equity fund ever means the market will crash 50%. But it's not good. It's a sign that things are desperately overvalued. And what I'm trying to do here, see, I just want to, um, you know, I want to kind of give you the flavor of this. I want to open the porta potty door and let the stink waft into your nose, right? Oh, what's, what's that? Oh, that's, that's shit. Urine. Oh, vomit. Great. You don't even have to talk about publicly traded securities. Uh, these are unicorn valuations. A unicorn is a startup company valued at a billion dollars or more by venture capital investors. Two professors studied 116 unicorns. They're basically all overvalued. Some of them, about 13 of them are overvalued by 100% or more. This guy, Masayoshi Son from SoftBank, these guys never, never managed other people's money before. His claim to fame is that he put something like 20 million into Alibaba and it's worth like 60 billion or something. And now he's raised close to 100 billion. He's not to 100 yet. Most of it from Saudi Arabia. I think they put in about 45 billion to put into technology stocks. And the way he arranged this thing, for every dollar you put in, you have to buy, I think it's 62 cents of preferred stock and the rest in equity, and he's got it set up so with the fees and the incentives, SoftBank gets probably 60% or more of the equity in the end. And that preferred is supposed to be some kind of safe thing. Actually, it's not a safe thing. It's a technology investment that with a very limited low return and lots and lots of risk. This is a crazy situation. It's just a sign of the times. This guy, credit strategist, from Deutsche Bank. When I read this, I thought, this guy says global asset prices are at their most elevated in history and it could cause a great destabilization event to the financial system. His job is to shove ideas to invest in fixed income instruments at you. And he's saying this. And he's saying the global economy seems to require elevated asset prices. I think he seems to be right about that. And here's another quote from John Hussman, same thing. Everything's overvalued and nobody is worried. Here's the fear, here's the fear index, scraping all time lows, it's below 10 again. Here's a record net short position in the futures contracts on the fear index. Here's uh, the consumer sentiment survey where people say whether well, they think the stock market's gonna go up in the next year and it's at an all-time high 65% probability with the market making new all-time highs. I normally don't care about the AAI sentiment survey, but again, when it hits an extreme, I kind of want to know about it. This has never happened. For the first time last week, for two weeks in a row, the bullish sentiment registered over 40%, two weeks in a row. Wow, nobody's worried. This is just a little, this is a, um, it's an index that gauges how people feel about monetary policy. When it's way high, people have a great deal of uncertainty about the effects of monetary policy. And when it's way low, they don't feel much uncertainty at all. And it's way low, it's scraping the bottom. No worries, no worries anywhere at all from any source. But remember what Buffett says, a bull market is like sex. It feels best just before it ends. And it feels absolutely wonderful. I hate to say almost orgasmic at this moment for most people. Okay. 
Don't make this mistake either. A lot of people made this mistake in the dot-com era. They thought owning the best businesses would save them. Their imaginations failed them. If you bought Intel at the top, you're still waiting to break even from the dot-com era. Same thing for Cisco, once the most valuable company in the world, still waiting to break even. Here's AT&T, still waiting to break even. That wasn't even, you know, not even really a tech stock, really. General Electric, still waiting to break even. Microsoft broke even last year. <laughs> hey, Coca-Cola broke even two years ago. And I know there's somebody in the audience right now going, uh, Dan, you know, they paid dividends, so maybe they broke even like, you know, 13 years. <laughs> You know, so you only have to wait 13 years if you buy this stuff. The, these are the best businesses, right? These are the cash gushers. These are the ones with huge economic moats. And they really kind of ruined your returns for more than a decade, almost two decades. So today, what are the ones? It doesn't matter how great Amazon is. Everybody knows. Don't get caught up in everybody. Everybody knows how great Amazon is, and it is. It's one of the greatest businesses in the history of capitalism. Makes you wonder how many times people have said that throughout history, right? Your imagination is failing if you don't think this thing can get cut in half. All kinds of things can happen, especially with these big companies like Amazon and the other ones I'll mention. Regulators are going to come after them at some point. And this thing trades at 40 times all the net profit they ever made since they were founded. Facebook, 14, 15 times revenue. and. Uh, you know, this is a great business, one of the all-time great ones in the history of humanity, period. And it was recently weaponized by a foreign government to change the outcome of our election. That business might have more risk than you think it does. It might have some regulatory risk. Google, 90% market shares everywhere it goes. Somebody might, you know, some politician might get kind of ambitious and go after these things, right? And Google actually isn't even that expensive. But NVIDIA is, 13, 12, 13 times revenue. Um, I had Mike Barrett, my assistant, uh, go through this thing, and he told me, he said, you know, it's priced for the revenue to grow 18% a year for the next 10 years. And it reminded me of this. This is a kind of a famous quote by Scott McNeely, the CEO of Sun Microsystems. You remember that? That was like the miracle company, right? It was wonderful. It was 64 bucks a share at the peak, as I recall, in the dot-com era. It was around 950 at this point. And what he didn't say at the top, and he, he told us that he couldn't say this at the top because he would have been sued for, you know, he had fiduciary responsibility. Basically, this just says, you idiots were paying 10 times sales for this company. Do you, know what it, do you know what that means? It means that I have to pay you all the revenues for 10 years in a row as a dividend to get your money back. Well, that means I have no expenses, no taxes, no further capital investment. That's kind of hard to do. And he says, you don't need any footnotes, you don't need any transparency, no regulators need to get involved, you're just an idiot for doing it. What were you thinking? So what do you do? What do you do? That's the question here. Now that, now that, I've, now that the porta potty door has been opened for 20 minutes here and I've, you know, it's wafted into your nose, what do you do? What do the best investors do? They're giving money back. Seth Klarman's one of the greatest investors in history. It's something like 16.5% for 34 years. And he had three really bad years in 2013, 14, and 15, kind of came back in 2016, as most of the value funds did. And, you know, this year, not doing so great. He's got 42% of his money in cash and is giving, we don't know how much back, but he's giving money back. Value Act, Jeffrey Elbin, brilliant investor, taught me a lot about Microsoft, really a smart guy, giving money back. Here's a, um, a tiger cub, Andreas Halverson, giving $8 billion of a $32 billion fund back. And he's not the only one. Of course, Buffett has $100 billion. These are all big investors. Eric Mendich from Eaton Capital, he's shutting down his $7 billion fund. He was the Goldman Sachs wunderkind uh, who opened a $3.5 billion hedge fund. He was the youngest partner in history, Goldman Sachs, age 27. He's shutting down. His returns stink. He's, his investors are bailing on him. Hugh Hendry shut down the Eclectica fund. Um, and I got an email this morning you know, you say, well, these guys all have billions of dollars. They can't buy the little stocks that we can buy, right? 
It's true, but I got an email this morning from Whitney Tilson, a very famous value investor who managed less than $200 million. He can buy those little things. He's shutting down. You know, he can't, his returns have suffered. He can't do it anymore. Here's GMO, Grantham Mayo and Van Otterloo. GMO.com is a great resource. You should go there and read their stuff. They do sort of value-oriented and trend-oriented forecasts. They're forecasting for the next seven years everything negative return. U.S. large caps, small cap stocks, U.S. high quality stocks, negative, negative, negative. U.S. bonds, the only positive returns he has on here are emerging market stocks and emerging market bonds, and a little teeny speck of a return for U.S. inflation-linked bonds. But all those returns stink. The biggest one is 2.7%. Smart people are looking around and saying, we can't buy a damn thing because everything's too expensive. That's the point, okay? Just ripping the door off the porta potty now. These guys surprised me. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, the credit strategist. They put out a report, they said, we've said for a while that we're running out of ideas and credit. Yeah, and these guys, whose job is to shove credit ideas down your throat, say, we're down to one credit strategy. U.S. investment-grade corporate bonds. We're down to one. That's the only thing these guys can do with a straight face. And then there are the other, the other side, okay? The shoeshine boys in 1929, and the day traders in the dot-com era, and the house flippers in the housing boom. Today, it's the VIX sellers, the people who, short, who are short the VIX the fear index. This guy says he's made 12 million bucks since 2012 shorting VIX securities. He is arrogant, he is filled with hubris, he sells himself as some kind of a volatility guru, and he says his great insight is, you know, the nature of volatility is that it falls over time. Well, it falls over the time you've been selling it. Come on, this is ridiculous. Let me tell you something. This guy is going to blow up. He's got 20% of his portfolio short this VIX stuff. He thinks it's free money. He's picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. He thinks the steamroller has two gears. It's got 16 gears, and it goes from first to 16th in an instant. The two biggest short VIX funds picked up a billion dollars, basically doubling in size in two weeks in August. You know, it can go the other way in two hours. These guys don't get it. Volatility becomes more volatile over time. New lows, higher highs, more volatile. Just because it hasn't been so volatile lately doesn't mean it's not going to be. These guys are going to get destroyed. Let me tell you something. You know what the difference is between a North Korean missile and this guy? This guy is actually going to hit something and blow the hell up one day. <laughs> Another thing he doesn't get is Vega. The sensitivity of the VIX ETFs to the underlying index. It's at an all-time high. So when the VIX wiggles, these things wiggle more than ever. More money is pouring into this. That, I think that's going to keep going. And these guys are going to blow up bad. Okay, what do you need to do? You need to think about risk. You think this is risk. You think, well, risk, that's something I take more of when I want to make more money. No, it's not true. This is risk. Risk is the range of possible outcomes. It's really, it's the risk of loss is what it really is. And it involves understanding the range of possible outcomes. The range of possible outcomes is wider for small cap stocks than it is for the S&P 500, probably. And it's wider for the S&P 500 than it is for treasury bonds, probably. You need to understand in those terms, and you'll notice the small cap stocks, they can go higher, they can go lower and all the way down the curve there. Am I predicting, am I telling you to sell everything and head for the hills and not own any stocks? Did I say that? No, I didn't. The point of all this, well, there's two points. The first point is, you guys obsess about where the stock market's gonna go. You wanna know that more than you wanna know anything. Okay, here it is. Um, the other thing is, you need to understand where we are. Where do we stand in any given moment? What's the environment? Where are we in the cycle? And that's really important. So what you don't do, um, you know, and, and negative advice, negative advice is extremely important, extremely important. 
Don't buy overvalued garbage. Don't short volatility. Don't do what everybody knows will make money. Do this. Hold plenty of cash. Not sexy, has teeth. Did I say go 100% cash? No! Just have plenty of it. Sell short shares of deteriorating businesses. We do that in extreme value. The shorts are looking pretty good today, a couple of them. Uh, if, if you so choose, there's extra risk in that. And buy extreme value, buy deep value where you find it. And this is the real point. I'm kind of, I'm kind of changing this deal up on you. Investing, investing, the actions that you seek to take is about individual securities. It's not about the overall, whether or not the stock market's going to go up or down. Okay? That's the real point here. It's about buying individual securities. Okay, I've got a lot of time. There's one more thing I want to tell you. What's next? What happens after, after this deluge if, if, you know, history plays out and the market falls? And it could be a year, it could be two, three, four, five years. I have no idea and don't care. I think we're going we're gonna to come into a very interesting period. In fact, I realized this morning what I'm about to tell you may have already begun. And it's like this. This is the Russell 3000 Growth and Value Indexes. Sucked wind during the dot-com era. Makes sense, right? Everybody was really optimistic, buying lots of growthy, growthy names and not buying the more staid, conservative kind of names. That makes sense. Then what happened? Well, people puked all that growth up, and then they said, hey, what do I want to buy now? Well, I want to buy mining stocks, and I want to buy home builders, and I want to buy banks, and I want to buy mortgages, right? And when you think about it, this is important too. You could only have had a financial crisis the size of the one we had with an asset like, with assets like housing and mortgages, right? Because you didn't question it. Nobody questioned it. U.S. housing, that doesn't fall in price. The 30-year U.S. mortgage, pff, sound as a pound. It's wonderful, wonderful assets. They're very, very safe. And because of that, we levered them up. We dropped them in the porta potty <laughs> And then we took them out and distributed them to the entire world. And they blew up spectacularly. The safe assets are the ones that really can blow you up the worst. You're, you're not afraid of that. You're less afraid of that in mining stocks, right? You know you're buying garbage. Biotech, you know it might go to zero, right? With stuff like housing and mortgages, you didn't think that for a second until it actually happened. And I think that's the way people are thinking now about stuff like Amazon and Facebook. Dan, you're an idiot. Amazon, Facebook, they're not going to fall 50%. That just can't happen. These are the widest moats, widest economic moats of any businesses in history. Just not going to happen. I would suggest that, that persons who say that lack imagination. Okay, so then what happened? Well, you know, then we puked up all the toxic waste that we created during the, the housing bubble. And uh, what was left? Well, you know, <laughs> if anything could make you forget about the dot-com bust, it was the housing bust, right? So that has screamed and outperformed value since 2007. And that's why all those guys I was telling you about are shutting down. They just, they can't perform, and they're getting hit with redemptions, and they're, they're all getting out of the business. I mean, I think I named like seven or eight people who are just getting out or giving money back. So what comes next? I think this comes next. And remember I told you, I think it's already started. I think the golden age of value investing, may have, it's already coming in, it's a trickle, right? The first part of it were the mining stocks that got absolutely frigging obliterated, and now they're dirt cheap, and we have one of those in extreme value. Uh, we should probably have another, another one or two. Um, kind of shy about it, though, because, you know, I got obliterated, too. Um, and the other sector now that falls into this category is retail. Retail has just been destroyed. The retail apocalypse. As a matter of fact, I was just, you know, looking for some stories and ideas and thoughts about this. 
And I just typed retail. I don't even think I finished typing the word retail into Google. And it said retail apocalypse. That's all that came up with, with stories about hundreds of stores closing, right? So I think, um, I think, I think it's, it's already begun. We've got mining, we've got retail. Who knows what else, you know, what other fun stuff might get absolutely obliterated so we can recommend that in extreme value. But I think you're going to look at something like the golden age of value investing, and people will maybe not start talking about this for, you know, five or ten years or something. But I think that's what these little things that I'm telling you about represent. Okay. So I didn't tell you to sell everything, right? Tell you a little story about that. Two guys, two hunters are walking through the woods. One of them collapses to the ground. His eyes roll up in his head. He stops breathing. His friend is panicking. He reaches into his pocket. He grabs his cell phone. Ah, it works. Calls 911. Operator, I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I think my friend is dead. And the operator says, okay, just calm down. Now, we have to make sure he's really dead. She doesn't hear anything. Then there's a gunshot, and the guy gets back on the phone and says, okay, now what? <laughs> I did not tell you to sell everything. I told you that lots of long-duration assets are overvalued. I told you to have plenty of cash. I didn't tell you to go 100% to cash. Heck, I've got a newsletter with Apple in it. It's got Apple, it's got mining stock, it's got Stanley Black & Decker, some other good stuff in there. There are longs to be had in the market, okay? So that, that is, I am not telling you to do that. I do not know when, you know, if, if there is a, a meltdown, as in the title of my talk, I can't tell you when it'll be. It could be a month, it could be a year, it could be five years, and I don't need to know. I don't know and I don't need to know, and neither do you. But I will, tell you, I will tell you what I do know. I do know this. I know where we stand, and I'm pretty sure I know what to do about it. Thank you.